narcotics. Look what came. <laughs> and it's funny because there's a Lois Anderson on the back of both. <laughs> Imagine that. I hope I said something <laughs> good. <laughs> so uh, I'm excited. And I've already been talking to a few people about doing apologetics workshops, one in Florida, one gentleman called and just he and one of another member at his church want to do it. So he asked if I would do them via Zoom. I said, why don't you just come into the Monday night, Monday group, but he wants specific apologetics 101 kind of thing. So I said, well, that's okay. So, and then a couple other people um, emailed me about possibly scheduling something with their women, another group with their catechesis group. So that's the kids. Good. That's great. Get the kids to defend that's the faith right away. Then when they hit college, they won't get torn away. <laughs> Because that seems to happen. <laughs> anyway, um, today we're going to look at Theophilus of Antioch. And once I started reading this book, I got really excited because this is an apologetic we can really use today. A lot of our friends are um, non-Christian at all that no Christian background. Some of them may have little Buddhas around their house. They may have uh, a friend who blesses their house with sage and stuff like that. So this particular book, it's actually three books in one. I, when I started reading right from the get go, I was, I said to Bobby, I said, this, this gentleman who ended up a bishop in Antioch, thus of Antioch, um, he's going to be on my go-to shelf. I have a go-to shelf of info that if I need to grab something quick, that's the shelf they hang out on. There's no rhyme or reason. It's just, it's got good stuff in there that I just pull it. Um, so let me get to sharing the screen and sorry, Dan, that you're driving and can't watch, but that's okay. You can listen. And let's get going here uh, from the beginning. Here we go. Okay, so the letters to Autolycus, or some just call it to Autolycus. And that's his icon. But Tara's coming. Let's get her in the room. So here's my timeline again. <laughs> and I know Kathy likes it. I love my timeline because it helps me place people where they're at. I had a tough time finding him in this timeline. I knew he was there. And then I found him. He's all the way up at the top. He's uh, just after Tatian and Justin Martyr. Same time frame for the end of their lives there. Um, and he's ahead of Melito. If you remember him, Melito of Sardis, he did a lot on the resurrection and on the Pasha, the Christian Easter. We call it Easter. They called it Pasha. Um, if you go straight down, follow my little arrow here. He goes in with the second Jewish revolt right after that. He is during the reign of Hadrian, not a good ruler. Antoninus, not a good ruler. But then Marcus Aurelius. Um, during Marcus Aurelius's time, that's what they called the Pax Romana during that era. He was also during Irenaeus and Tertullian comes into the picture as well as Hippolytus or Hippolytus, depending on how you want to pronounce that. Okay. Then I thought, oh, right. A lot of us don't know where places are in the Roman Empire. Now, I think we're all familiar with Antioch. Does anyone know? In the New Testament, what, what one thing stood out in the city of Antioch? What happened there? That's where Christians are first called Christians. Exactly. <laughs> Which ties into um, Theophilus's book to Autolycus 
And so here it is down here, see my red arrow, and then I circle it so that we kind of get an idea. Now, Antioch was also Paul's home church, the church that sent him. Um, he would go back to Antioch a lot. So Antioch for Eastern Christians is a very important city. Uh, they had a bishop. And if you remember when Paul tells Timothy to basically set the churches in order, ordain the elders, the presbyters, the bishops, get things organized, Antioch is part of that. The other major city during early Christianity is down here in Egypt, Alexandria. And then, of course, we have Rome where both Peter and Paul were martyred. So when you're looking at church history, those are the three major cities. Out of Antioch in Syria, the church goes east. It goes into Parthia, India, and China. And then Alexandria actually goes south and hits uh, Aksum, which is actually Ethiopia now. And then of course you have Rome and Northern Africa, Carthage. Carthage wasn't such a, Brit, a big Christian city as far as importance. And prior to the Roman bishop deciding he's just gonna be the ruler of everyone in the six, 700s, up until then, there were three bishops that were the key bishops, Antioch, Alexandria, and Rome. And every single one of them could trace their bishopric back to the time of the apostles. So I'm going to keep using this map as I start talking about other gentlemen, because it helps me. I don't know if it helps you, but it helps me place where we're at. So in, oh, oh, I had to move my Bible. Anyway, in Acts 1 and in Luke 1, Luke writes to Theophilus. So sometimes the question is that one? It's this Theophilus is not the Theophilus in the Bible. It's not the one in the New Testament. There's probably about 60 years between them. <laughs> so it's not the one Luke writes to, same name, but not the one from Luke. So let's, I just want to clarify that because sometimes people get that confused and that's fine. He was born around 120 AD. Again, they're going by abouts. He states in his letters to Autolycus, he was a pagan. He worshiped the gods of his fathers and grandparents and so forth. He would pay homage. He would sacrifice to them. He was, in his own words, a pagan worshiper. And so what happens? He states in his letter again that he was given the Holy Scriptures now, around 120, mostly he got the Old Testament and then some Gospels. Now, the whole New Testament was written by now, 120, but not every people and not every city had all the books together yet. Eventually, that would happen. We, have, we went through the evidences for the Christian faith and found that we have the codices, which are the full New Testaments, pretty much that are late 100s, um, but he states, by reading even the Old Testament, a careful study of it, he converted to Christianity. If that's not the power of God's word, in effect, I don't know what is. I had done, um, Saturday, I had to do a presentation for world missions. And I was doing it on the Uyghurs in China. And that's in my church history class. I found a style or a um, column 
that has the story of how Christianity came to Western China and became the religion of light in the Tang dynasty. And I said, so even now, because the Uyghurs can speak the language on that column, the word of God is there because they have the whole gospel story of Jesus coming, born of a virgin, suffered, died, was crucified, well, was crucified, died, buried, and rose again. The, the professor looked at me. He said, yeah, but somebody has to tell them that. I said, but they can read it there. So they have the gospel there. He said, no, 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 no. You don't understand. How are they going to make a decision for Jesus? Tilted my head and crooked it a little. And I said, first, nobody can make a decision for Jesus and the word of God. God has promised the gospel is the power of salvation. And that's what happened for Theophilus. He studied the word of God and God granted him true faith. So. A few years later, he becomes the sixth bishop of Antioch. It's the eighth year of the reign of Marcus Aurelius. And Clement, Ignatius are bishops in Rome and Alexandria. So that's, again, just kind of fitting him in there. He dies either 181 or 182. There are no details. He is not a martyr. Uh, Isidius says he fell asleep in his Lord. And I think that's really sweet. You know, he's, he's roughly 61, 62 years old. That's a pretty good lifetime for back then. And to have it written that you fell asleep in the Lord. I tell you, that's the way I would want to go. So let's move on his writings okay we really we only have this one except parts <laughs> again with the parts and lost apologetics um jerome who was the one who translated the bible into latin okay the vulgate and isubius they both record that they had in possession commentaries that Theophilus of Antioch wrote. He wrote a commentary on Genesis, Proverbs, all four gospels, the epistles. Then he does something that I thought was only done recently. He wrote a harmony of the four gospels. All the miracles that you see, like especially in what we call the synoptic gospels, that's Matthew, Mark, and Luke, because they're almost the same in everything. He wrote a harmony of them. He lined them up so that you could see like the story of um, Jesus saying the Beatitudes. And all three, he lines them up. Unfortunately, these are gone. The only one we have left is Autolycus, which is a shame. He also wrote against the heretics in Anyone remember who the Marcionites are and what they believed? They were the ones that uh, believed the Old Testament was no longer valid, that it was the product of uh, the God of the Old Testament was the semi-dirge and evil. Yes. Okay, anyone remember the Hermogenes genes? Yeah. Oh, that's a tough one. I'm going to pull it up on my phone because my brain just went blank. <laughs> and I don't know if that's good for the teacher to uh, have her brain go, her brain go blank, but they are, come on phone. Um, okay. He's the one mentioned by Paul who turned away from Christ in the end. Evidently he started teaching a whole bunch of bad stuff. Theophilus writes against him as well. Okay. The Autolycus, its format is our love for God means a love for humanity. 
Now, isn't that a lot like what Luther tells us and Gene Edward Veith has said in his book, uh, Spirituality of the Cross? We love God by loving our neighbor. So what happened was Autolycus, who is a friend of Theophilus, he begins to write letters and makes disparaging comments in conversation against the Christians and against Jesus Christ. And he starts calling Christians atheists, um, usurpers of authority because you call Jesus Lord instead of Caesar Lord. You have no social um, morals. You have secret meetings on the first night of the week. You, we're pretty sure you're sacrificing your children. Um, you try to drown your children. I assume that would have been references to baptism. Um, you eat the flesh and drink the blood of some man who happened to have been a criminal crucified by the Romans, found guilty of harsh crimes and usurping the Caesar's power, blah, 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 blah. So Autolycus, he then writes these three books, three letters, we could call them as well, to his friend and is basically in all three books defending the Christian faith. But his way of doing it, again, I've, I've said there are many different ways to do apologetics. There's going to be times where you are writing against a heretic or talking to a heretic, anti-Trinitarian, Jehovah's Witness, Mormon, what have you, um, some Pentecostals, I'm going to slip over in that category, not all, um, heterodox, and you have to defend the faith. And you have to be strong because they're naming the name of Christ. They're saying, I'm a Christian because they can lead a younger Christian or a Christian who's only on the milk of the word. They can lead them astray and they can be one of the causes that falling from the faith. So with those, I, 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 Dr. Montgomery always said, for the wolf in the pulpit, fire away. For the sheep in the pew, gently and tenderly show them the truth. So you're always going to have that. Now, in discussions with friends or family, you're going to have either uh, tactic. You're going to have some where you need to lead in love. You're going to have others who are so adamant about no God existing you need to be a little more forceful. So there's different tactics. And Theophilus, no matter what, kept saying to Autolycus, I am a Christian and nothing which concerns Christianity do I consider foreign to myself. This is a great statement. One, Autolycus is saying that horrible Christian name of yours, you know, and your God who was a crucified criminal. And Theophilus is saying, I am a Christian. I take that name on. I am a, I was a pagan. I'm a Christian now. His other aspect of this is that anything that concerns Christianity, he was right there on. He was right there and he knew it. He understood what he believed and why he believed it. That's how we should be. We should know what we believe. We learn that in our catechisms and our confession through the sermons our pastors preach. And we should know why we believe it. We should know the reasons behind it. And he did. Okay. So I said, this is split into three books. So I'm going to outline book one a little more than I'm going to the other two books. And there's a reason for it. So let's go. This is what he says in book one in the opening. Since then, my friend, you have assailed me with empty words. And I just love that. 
there is this gentlemanly way of him approaching his friend. He didn't yell at his friend. He didn't say, yeah, but you're not my friend anymore. He still called him friend, even though the guy was making fun of his Christian faith. But he does go after the gods, Autolycus worships. He says, but you, you boast of your gods of wood, stone, hammered metal, bronze casted, carved, graven, what have you. And he says, and they don't see you or hear you because they're the works of man's hands. Our God is different. And he begins his apologetic on the nature of God. And here he has, since you call me a Christian, as if this were a damning name, I avow I am a Christian. And in the end, he's hoping to be serviceable to God. But his apologetic style, and we've met up with different kinds from the different men we've studied thus far. He hits right on the nature of God. Last week, um, with the apologist we went through, he went through more the illogical nature of the idols. They don't hear, they don't speak. You got to feed them. You, you know, you got to move them and carry them. And if they fall in water, they drown and blah, blah, blah. Here he begins talking about the nature of God. God is ineffable. God is indescribable. In other words, you can't carve God. He can't be seen by the eyes of flesh. He's incomprehensible. He's unfathomable. Inconceivable. And on this part about being inconceivable, he places the love of God. How could God love us who reject him, who spat on him, who crucified him? who hated him, who did not want to know the one true God. And throughout the book, you find quotes from Romans a lot, especially Romans 1. But this is who he is presenting to his friend. He continues. The Christian God is incomparable. Well, that's true. Our God has eyes. Theirs don't. Our God sees, theirs don't. Our God hears, our God loves. Our God came and paid the price for us himself instead of demanding payment from us. He's unrivaled in goodness, inimitable, in kindness, honorable. This is who. He presents to his friend, this is the one true God. Then he goes and he, he responds to his friend. If I call him light, I name his own work. He said, let there be light. And there was light. If I call him word, I name him his sovereignty. If I call him mind, I speak of his wisdom. If I say spirit, I speak of his breath. Now, there's a couple of words there, and I'll get through that in a moment. Actually, let me go back. When the second century apologists used the word word, they meant Jesus. And when they say wisdom, they do mean his spirit. Okay. Then he goes on because... It's almost like he writes this conversationally, anticipating <clears throat> what Autolycus is going to say. So who is God? Watch the creed in here. Without beginning, unbegotten, unchangeable, immortal, creator and maker of the universe. What parts of the creed do you see in Theophilus's description of who God is. Mm -hmm. 
anyone. I believe in God, the Father, Almighty. Almighty. Mm -hmm. Maker okay. of heaven and earth. There we go. Okay. We also have it in the Nicene later that Jesus is unbegotten. Oh, no, that's in the Athanasian. Um, okay. So, Theophilus, because the conversation starts with the ridicule of Jesus is God, starts with who the true God is. And it's because Theophilus and the Christians were accused of being atheists because we can't see God. In today's world, it's the scientist. I can see a science experiment. I can't see your God. Book two gets very, very complicated, but it deals with God and creation. And how God created all parts of the world through his word. Again, that's through Jesus. So book two is very good to have if you're going to be dealing with an atheist who elevates science and challenging them on similar grounds that Theophilus does. And see, in all of these apologists, there are parts we can grab when we need it. Do we need to speak in love? We take, uh, who did I say back then? Uh, Irenaeus or um, Felix. If we need to do more scientific, you might want to pull out Tertullian and definitely Theophilus book two. So all of these tools we have in arguments similar, they're never going to be exactly what we need, but they become a simple tool that you can adjust for your situation and who you're talking to. So we have also that God is invisible. Again, going against the science that wants proof. They want proof. Okay. This is what he uses to prove. For as the soul in man is not seen, being invisible to men, but is perceived through the motion of the body. So God cannot indeed be seen by human eyes, but is beheld and perceived through his providence and works. This is where we get to point to the things God has done in the world, for the world. He reigns on the just and the unjust. We get to actually say the work God did in and through Christ, through his birth, his miracles, that even the Roman historians attest to, his death, his execution, and resurrection. And it's always coming back there. Now, a little tidbit. Remember we talked a couple of weeks ago about um, the Trinity being an early Christian teaching. Because you have the Jehovah's Witnesses and you have the Oneness Pentecostals who deny the Trinity. Oh, that's a man-made thing and Rome made that up. Really? Because Tertullian... 20 years later, copied the term from Theophilus. And Theophilus, and let me switch to the next slide. Theophilus uses the Greek term trias. The Latin term would be trinitas. When he refers to Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, he refers to them as trias, set of three. Tertullian then is the first one to describe the God of the Bible as trias, okay? So you've got in 180, Theophilus, and then 20 years later, 200, Tertullian using that. And in every one of the books we've looked at, the apologists we've looked at, they use 
word and wisdom. And the word, just like the word comes from your mouth, the word comes from the father. And the wisdom of the word comes from the father through the word, the spirit. So there is this Trinitarian formula. Even this early in the church, we're actually making a term for it. it. It gets streamlined as the church grows, but it's there. Okay. I love this. This is his prayer for Autolycus at the end of book one. He says to Autolycus, by him you speak, O oh man. His breath you breathe, yet him you know not. And this is your condition because of the blindness of your soul, the hardness of your heart. But if you will, you may be healed. And he goes on and says, entrust yourself to the physician and he will couch the eyes of your soul and your heart. Who is the physician? God, who heals and makes alive through his word and wisdom. There's that Trinitarian trius again. God, word, wisdom. And we know that the... Theophilus is talking about the written word of God, but also the living word, logos, and the wisdom of God, God's spirit. After he makes this plea, he goes right into the resurrection. He's talked about God. In book two, he's talked about the God of creation. And at the end, he talked about the fall of man. In book three, he begins to talk about the prophets because that's what specifically God used to convert him. It was the fulfillment of the Old Testament prophecies, specifically that God would not leave his soul to and body to corruption. And he hits with the resurrection. And then he tells him, my friend, God's going to raise your flesh immortal with your soul. If now you believe on him, and then you shall know that you've spoken unjustly against him. So he's kind of telling him, listen, if you believe, this is a good resurrection. If you don't believe, you're still getting raised immortal. Your soul's still going to be immortal just not going to be really a good place for you to end up. And he goes on, when the resurrection takes place, then you will believe. So you may not believe now and you may die in unbelief, but trust me, when the resurrection comes, you're going to believe now. And that's a reference back to Philippians. Every knee shall bow. He goes on and he says, your faith will be reckoned for unbelief. Because they didn't believe. He didn't believe before dying. He says, unless you believe now. Theophilus understood and proclaimed that faith came by the careful study of the word of God. Paul said, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. So Autolycus, I mean, Theophilus is simply repeating Couching it in language that Autolycus can understand. And he tells him, search the scriptures. He, his order of argument is as follows. You have a false God. Your God can't hear. It's man-made. Our God is immortal. He's risen from the dead. You may think he was a criminal crucified. He was crucified for your sins, not his. You must have faith in the risen Lord. But he does do a little bit of what Jesus did. Jesus, remember, told, told the people, even if one came back from the dead, you wouldn't believe. 
Theophilus uses the same thing. In the third book on the resurrection, he basically says, even now, if someone was risen from the dead and came to you and, and people knew this, you wouldn't believe. But I implore you to search the Holy Scriptures. And sometimes that's what we have to do. Because we have to say, read the Bible. We'll come back and we'll discuss it. Read the Bible more. We'll come back and we'll discuss it. Because God has promised his word does not come back void. So he goes on again with the absurdity of idolatry. And he then uses his own conversion. This is the last thing he does. And we always talked about the when you're talking to someone about the Christian faith, stick with the objective. You might want to start off your testimony, but stick with the objective. Theophilus flips it. He sticks with the objective and then at the end gives a subjective. Look at my life. Aut Autolycus, you knew me as a pagan. We have been friends. Look at my life change now. But he's based that on what God has done, what Jesus did, and Jesus' resurrection. And now you can see the effect of that work of God in my life. All right. In his um, third book, he's talking about his life, the life of Christians. He says, far be it from Christians that do such deeds and should enter their mind. He's going against the accusations. For temperance dwells within them. Self-restraint is practiced. Monogamy is observed. Chastity is guarded. Injustice is exterminated. Reverence is preserved. God is acknowledged. Truth controls. Grace guards. Peace protects. Wisdom teaches. Life directs. The holy word guides and God reigns. Again, this is the Christian life as a witness to the truth. And as Christians... The people around us should see something different because sometimes that's what begins the conversation. And then we make sure objective truth, objective truth, objective truth. Yes, can't you see that this changed in me? That wasn't me. That was because of the power of God through his salvation. But whether you're beginning with that uh, your Christian life is the beginning of the subject or your ending saying all of this and see what God has done. Couch it though and make sure objective truth is the center part and the central part. Okay. Um, his conversion. And this is what he said happened. He read the scriptures. He realized everything the Spirit of God told in the old prophets happened. And then his plea to Autolycus, give reverential attention to the prophetic scriptures, and they will make your way plainer for escaping the eternal punishments. There is that plea again. Repent and believe. But why? Because you read the scriptures. You saw that everything the Old Testament prophet said has come to pass. Believe, believe. Okay. Um, one of his arguments, just going to give you a couple of the quotes. This is his argument on creation. And I love it. If God had drawn the world from pre-existent matter, what would be so extraordinary about that? A human artisan makes a from a given material whatever he wants, while God shows his power by starting from nothing to make all he wants. Again, remember I said I got my little shelf or my go-to shelf in the book that's highlighted 
because I can use that with the atheist who said, or even the Christian who believes that God started and then just let evolution take over after that. Okay. On baptism, here we go again. Moreover, those things which were created from the waters were blessed by God, so that this might also be a sign that men would at a future time receive repentance and remission of sins through water and the bath of regeneration. So there again in Theophilus, we find a apologetic for those who reject the promises of God in the waters of baptism. We find that in 181, again, not very far from the apostles and the Bible, they continue to teach remission of sins through the water and the bath of regeneration. Okay, thus ends Theophilus. Next week, we're going to do the church historian, Isubius, because he's not only a historian, he's an apologist. He defends the faith, even in his history of the Christian church. So that's who we're going to look at next week. So, okay, I know that was a lot. Questions come, uh, go ahead, Dan. Um, it seems to me that um, Theophilus kind of preferred to talk about God um, sort of in the abstract, uh, incomprehensible, invisible, immortal, all of those things. And it, but it also seems that he eventually got to God in the flesh and pointed to the concrete. Do you, do you think that's, that's the way he did it? Is he wanted to talk more about God um, you know what I'm saying? Now, instead of going to Jesus first, God in the flesh, like saying, there he is, he sort of argues philosophically at first. Yeah, he definitely takes a philosophical um, position. And I think that's because of the accusations from his friend are dealing with, your God's not a God. You can't even see him. Well, no, we can't. But that proves he's God, because God is beyond us. He's outside of us. He's above us. He's greater than us. Um, so I think that's where he took it. But the letters are so short and so quick, it, he doesn't stay on the philosophical long, especially once he gets to creation and the fall. And once he hits the fall, and that we are sinners. And that's why everyone's worshiping false gods. They need to know the true God. We know who he is because of Christ. So he's kind of bringing him from where he's at to where he needs to be. And it's a, a little bit of a windy road, but he does he does get there. And I, I sometimes I think even our conversations, we hit rapid trails. But we have to just keep in mind we gotta we gotta land on Jesus. You know? So questions, comments. I'm going to get the book. That's what you did. Yeah, me too. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, the books will be going out. I'm going to package them up tomorrow if you ordered them. So these are going out tomorrow and uh, we'll get those out. But um, any other questions on Theophilus or on his books, the three books to his friend? Yes. Can I ask you another question about, um, you were talking about the early church fathers used word and wisdom mm -hmm. to talk about the son and the Holy Spirit. Um, there's that passage in Proverbs that uh, wisdom is personified there. Uh, it was brought forth in the beginning um, and all that. You know what I'm talking about? Um, I had heard from some that that was a reference to Jesus. Did the early church fathers see that as a reference to the Holy Spirit? Ooh, I don't know. I'd have to look at some of their sermons on Proverbs. Um, 
because that would be an interesting thing. I do know also that uh, Bishop Timothy, who is, we're talking early 700s, when he was debating the caliph in Syria, referenced the Trinity as we know God exists, you believe in Allah, we believe in God, his word, and, and he, he stretches out that idea of word and wisdom. Um, when I read his debate a couple of weeks ago for school, the usage of it from the other apologists I was reading in prep for this started to click that it the word comes up okay if we look human speak can we the word comes out of my mouth but there's the wisdom behind that word hopefully <laughs> um so you can't separate the word from the person can't separate the wisdom from the person all three are there and bishop timothy used that. Then I started noticing in Ir Irenaeus and Tertullian and Justin Martyr and then Theophilus that they're all using these terms, God, word, spirit, and as this is who God is and who we worship. Um, but I, I, maybe I should look at Chris Ostrom and his sermons and see if he has any in Proverbs and what he does. Before question, Go ahead. Comment. Go ahead. before the end of the fourth century, uh, the church did not have any uniform uh, language by which to speak about God and to conceive Him uh, until the Nicene Creed, but really the 371, the Nicene uh, Creed, uh, uh, Council of Constantinople. Uh, so uh, you do find a lot of things and uh, a lot of variation before, let's say, late 300s. Mm -hmm. Agreed. For Agreed. what it's worth. I mean, Theophilus himself, he's the first one to use trias. So they believed and understood, but how do you frame that? So, yeah, I mean, and the Trinity debate under Athanasius, that's a different, you know, that's where things have to start getting squared away. And this is what we specifically confess. So it's actually very interesting uh, to read uh, the uh, pre-Nicene -pre fathers on the Trinity and uh, to follow their thought processes. It's not that they didn't know. Mm -hmm. Again, there was no uh, formalized, agreed upon language, universal language like there is after Nicaea. But uh, if you read their ideas of God, and they, somebody mentioned earlier, uh, they speak of him as what he's not. He's not conceivable. He's not uh, visible. He's not, it's always in he's not this. Um, because mm -hmm. there's a certain there's a certain term for that kind of language which I forget right now, but um, uh, very interesting stuff. That's all I can say. No, I I agree, and I'm glad you brought it up. That it's always uh, he's not like this, and it, right. and it's trying to explain the Trinity almost in the negative first because right. It, that's such a, I mean, B.B. Warfield wrote in, um, it's in his eight volume series on various doctrines. The, the volume on the, on the Holy Scripture, he starts the first chapter saying, the doctrine of the Trinity is a revealed doctrine. You can't just get it from reading God has to take that reading and make it alive to you. Um, 
And I, I've heard other pastors say, if, if, you know, we Christians, we say the triune God. You know, that's a complicated doctrine. If we wanted to make Christianity more palatable, removing the Trinitarian doctrine would ease that because it, that's so hard to comprehend. You know, so, but I like how you, Chaplin, how you said that it, it's done in the negative until they can figure out the language. I like that. Thank you. Okay. Any other comments or questions? Nope. Okay. Then I'm going to leave you till next week. I'm going to put this on pause. All right, so I just wanted to share with any, everyone briefly that um, I am putting together apologetics workshops. That's where you get to invite me to come and teach your group. This can be an adult Bible study. This can be a um, LWML women's group or your youth or your catechism class. And I just want to share with you um, just a little bit. There are several formats, and you can also head over to my website, www.lutherangirl.org, and click on, at the top menu, Apologetics Workshops. And again, don't forget to be able to get your books. And if you get all three of the apologetics books, Creedal, They Were Eyewitnesses, and then Reason to Reason, 30% off using the coupon code Apologetics Bundle. So everyone, have a great week. Lord willing, we'll be back on Monday for Asubius. God bless you all. Bye.